When somebody says, how you doing, and you really are doing bad, I mean, things are just awful. What I want you to do is look at your watch. When they say, how you doing, I want you to look at your watch and say, well, at exactly 3.30, I'll be doing super good. And they might say, well, what's going to happen at 3.30? Then you say, at 3.30, I'm going to be positive. Now, I'm going to be negative until then, but man, at 3.30, I'm going to get positive. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do I understand this right? You're going to be negative until 3.30, and then from 3.30 on, you're going to be positive. I sure am, man, alive. I can't wait for 3.30. 3.30 to get here because then I'm going to be positive. They say, now, are you kidding me? You mean you're going to wait till 3.30 to be positive? Why don't you go ahead and be positive now? Then you look at him and you kind of smile and say, Zig Ziglar was one of the world's most popular motivational speakers. Ziglar was one of 12 children raised by a widowed mother during the Great Depression. He wrote over 25 books, including See You at the Top, and inspired millions of people around the world. In this exclusive training, Ziegler shares with us the incredible power of the right mental attitude, the massive impact it can make on your life, and what you need to do to develop it. Special thanks to the Ziegler family for partnering with us to release this exclusive content on our YouTube channel. Enjoy. Okay, super, super, super. There never has been a doubt in the minds of any of the people that I've been talking with about whether or not the right mental attitude was important. Whether you're a coach, a student, a businessman, a housewife, a husband, a salesman, a builder, doesn't make any difference what you are. The right mental attitude is important. As a matter of fact, in America today, there are over 30,000 schools teaching just about everything. They'll teach you how to do anything from trimming toenails to taking out tonsils. They'll teach you how to put hash on the plate a little more attractively or how to run heavy earth-moving equipment. But there's not a school on the face of this earth that's going to teach you how to be any better than mediocre unless you've got the right mental attitude. Now, the right mental attitude involves a lot of phases. We're going to be talking a lot about positive thinking in this particular phase. As you well know, the Rich Life course itself embodies many other things. It's the actually, instead of just a positive mental attitude, it's a positive life attitude. But gee, I don't want to sell that positive mental attitude, sure, because that's the thing that makes so much difference so many times. See, it's a series of little things that makes the difference. You can call a Girl, a kitten, and she'll love you. Call her a cat, and you're in trouble. I mean, and it's not really that much difference. You can say she's a vision, and you score all kind of points. Call her a sight, and you're in trouble. <laughs> or can you imagine a man looking in his wife's eyes and saying, you know, honey, when I look into your eyes, the wheels of time just stand still. Oh, that's poetic. That's moving. That'll get action. I, I guarantee you. But that's so much better, you know, when he does it that way than if he were to say, you know, honey, you got a face that stop a clock, you know. <laughs> and yet it's just that, that little bit of difference. You know, if this watch of mine were four hours wrong, I wouldn't have any difficulty at all. I can look at my watch and say, hey, that's bad wrong. But if it's four minutes wrong, I got a problem because I can't tell that. And next Monday morning at 10, 18, I get aboard that aircraft going to Portland, Oregon. You see, and if my watch is four minutes wrong and I get there at 10, 22, you see, I got a problem because, well, let me tell you about the deal I worked out with the airlines. It's a simple deal. It, it just says that if I'm not there when they get ready to go, that they're just to go ahead without me. <laughs> And I, I found out last summer right here in Dallas that they live up to their end of the agreement, too. <laughs> and I also found out it's easy to catch those dudes before they leave the ground, okay? <laughs> a little bit makes a lot of difference. I imagine you're familiar with the story of the great racehorse, Nashua. Nashua won over one million dollars on the racetrack in less than an hour of actual racing. Hundreds of hours of training, hundreds of hours of practice, but one hour of racing. Now, as you well know, you can take a hundred dollars and buy ten, or rather, you can take a million dollars and buy one hundred ten thousand dollar racehorses. But a lot of people don't know the reason. The reason is because a million dollar horse runs exactly one hundred times as fast as a ten thousand dollar one. Right? <laughs> He doesn't? 
How much faster is a million dollar horse? Actually, would you say twice as fast? 50% faster, 20% faster, 10% faster? How much faster is a million dollar horse than a $10,000 one? Let me give an example which I think pretty well says it. Five or six years ago at the Arlington Futurity, the winning racehorse received $100,000 more than the one who came in second place. Now, the Arlington Futurity is a race which is one and one-eighth miles in length, which, as you well know, is 71,280 inches. <laughs> you didn't know that, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> well, you know it now because that's a fact. I spent the day. I can tell you that's right. And the winning horse got there exactly one inches one inch ahead of the one who came in second place. 71,280 inches of racing, the winner got there one inch in front of the second one. 1974, the winner of the Kentucky Derby, the jockey that rode that horse across the line first, get, was given a check for $27,000. Substantially less than two seconds later, jockey number four crossed the finish line, and they wrote him a check for thirty. dollars Dollars. And somebody said, is that right? And I said, no, it ain't right, but that's the way they do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's always been the way they've done it. You see, we're not going to change the rules for the game of life. There's no commission for the salesman who almost makes a sale. And yet there's full commission if he just barely makes the sale. Now, what's the difference between just barely making it and just barely missing it. I believe so many times it's wrapped up in this thing called the right mental attitude. Does positive thinking work? Well, let's take you to a baseball game. It was a baseball game that was played a long time ago. It was played right here in Dallas, Texas, as a matter of fact. During the 1930s, when minor league baseball was real baseball, the San Antonio team had seven hitters on the team that had hit over 300 the year before. Everybody figured they was going to win the pennant because that many 300 hitters on a team, how are you going to beat them? But the truth of the matter is they lost the first game and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. As a matter of fact, at the end of 21 games, that San Antonio team had lost the first 18 games. The pitcher was blaming the catcher. The catcher was blaming the infield. The infield was blaming the outfield. The manager was blaming this, that, and the other. And everybody was blaming the manager. But in reality, the manager was a good one. His name was O'Reilly. He knew there wasn't a thing wrong with his team except the fact they were, suffering from, from, they were suffering from stinking thinking. In other words, they needed that little check up from the neck up as well. So because of the fact that they had played this one game in Dallas, they had been beaten one to nothing. As a matter of fact, the only hit they got was a scratch single, and that was by the pitcher. And now they were getting ready for the second game. Well, at this time, there was a fellow in Dallas named Slater who was a faith healer. Oh, they said that Mr. Slater could just do anything, and so O'Reilly devised a plan. Just before the game was to start, about 30 minutes before, he rushed into the club and he said, Fellas, give me your two best bats. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take them somewhere. When they come back, we'll have the answer. We're going to win the game today. Don't worry about a thing. He was excited. About two minutes before game time, he came back in. He had those bats in that wheelbarrow, the two best bats from each man, and he was really excited. As a matter of fact, if you think he'd been excited before this time, you should have seen him. He was on fire with enthusiasm. He was burning up. He said, fellas, I've taken these bats to Mr. Slater. He's put his blessings on him. He says that all we got to do is step up, to that play, step up to that plate, take a cut. He says, we're going to knock the ball out of there. He says, we're going to win the game today. We're going to win the penalty. He said, fellas, go get them, Tigers. And guess what? the Tigers did that day. Now remember, this is a team that had been beaten one to nothing the day before. They'd only gotten one hit, and that was a scratch single. But today, same ballpark, same team, same circumstances. This team, the San Antonio team, got 37 hits. They scored 22 runs. They hit 11 home runs. I don't think I need to add that they won the game. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they went on to win the pennant. But ladies and gentlemen, here is the kicker. For years, they sold Slater bats around the Texas League at an enormous premium. But the interesting thing is they never proved that Slater had ever even seen the bats. 
Let me ask you a question. Suppose he had seen the bats. What could a, a, a fellow do to a pile of wood? <laughs> we know he couldn't do anything at all. But what could he do to the minds of the men who were swinging that wood? If you knew you were going to get a base hit, wouldn't you step up there with more enthusiasm, with more zeal, with more determination, and with more confidence, knowing that you were going to get a hit? And isn't that really what positive thinking is all about. All positive thinking works. There's just no question about it. I guess that's one of the reasons I love the Bible so much. You know, it's full of so many good positive thinking stories. You know, one of my favorites is the story of David and Goliath. How many of you ever heard the story of David and Goliath? <laughs> You're fixing to get the Zigglerized version, okay? <laughs> you remember the story? Here's old nine-foot Goliath, 400 pounds. He's standing up on the hillside, you know, and he's shouting those obscenities. He says, come on, you dogs, come out and fight. Here come little David, 17 years old, running up there, you know, had him started to shave <laughs> and, he, and, and he said to his brothers he said don't, don't, don't you fellas hear that guy and they said yeah we hear him David said what you going to do about it and they said what do you mean what you going to do about it David said aren't you going to fight him they said are you kidding well man people get hurt fighting guys like that <laughs> you know they looked at old Goliath and figured he is too big to hit and uh, David looked at him and figured he's too big to miss you know <laughs> Then he said, where's the king? And the brother said, king don't feel so good. David said, I'll take him on. They said, you're crazy. See, they looked at, Gol at Goliath and compared Goliath's size to theirs. Boy, that made him big. Nine feet tall, 400 plus pounds. David looked at Goliath and compared him to God. And boy, that made him small. And, and in the case, for those of you who have not read the rest of the story, David and God one. Now, what I like, what I like about good positive thinking stories is I, you know, I, I like that. I, I, I like to see winners, and positive thinking makes winners. But, you know, the right mental attitude involves so much more than just the go-get attitude. I believe also it involves the go-give attitude. I think the story of Dave Murphy, or Dave Anderson and Jim Murphy, pretty well says what I want to say. It's a brutally hot day. And some guys are out working on a railroad. And they're right by the uh, switching station and one of the private cars pulls off to the side there and parks. And the short section of the train that it was on was uh, going to sit there for a couple of hours, obviously. And all of a sudden, when the guys were working, they saw the window come up in the back car, which was the uh, most beautiful car they'd ever seen. Handmade, absolutely magnificent. And a voice called out to the crew foreman, Dave, is that you? And old Dave Anderson looked around and said, sure is, Jim. And Jim said, have you got a few minutes? Can you come visit with me? And old Dave said, man, I sure have. So he was glad to get out of that hot sunshine, you know, and he walked in and they visited there for about an hour. And then finally when uh, Dave uh, left the car, he shook hands very warmly with uh, Jim Murphy and he went back to work. And the, and the other guys cried around old Dave and said, Dave, was that Jim Murphy, the president of the railroad? And old Dave said, sure, that's Jim. They said, you mean you know him personally? And they said, know him personally? Why, I've known him for over 20 years. As a matter of fact, Jim Murphy and I went to work with this railroad on exactly the same day. We started together. Sure, I know him well. And one of the guys says, well, Dave, I, I don't understand. Jim Murphy is now the president of the railroad, <laughs> and you're still out here working in the, in the hot sun. So how do you explain that? Dave Anderson very quietly said, it's, it's very easy to explain. A little over 20 years ago, I went to work for a dollar and 75 cents an hour, and Jim Murphy went to work for the railroad. See, I don't care what you do in life. If you go to work for a company and want a good salary, you'll probably get it. But if you go to work for the company with the idea of working for them, not only will you get a better salary, but you'll get infinitely more satisfaction out of life. If you study your grades in school to make a grade, you probably will make a good grade. But if you will study for the knowledge that is there, if you'll really explore ambitiously what those books have to offer, not only will you get a better grade, but you also will get the knowledge that is so important. 
The go-give attitude is important. The Jim Murphy, Dave Anderson story says a whole lot. I think the story of Israel also says a lot. You remember 1948 when they were reborn as a nation exactly as the Bible had said they would? You remember since then there have been something like three million people either to settle there or who were already there. And this is in one of the most isolated sections of the world as far as the geography is concerned. They're surrounded uh, by their natural enemies. And there's got a lot, there's a lot of desert there. It's not exactly the garden spot of the world. And yet in just a little less than 30 years, they've made it the showcase of the world where crime is almost non-existent, where pro poverty is way, way down, where there's a spirit and a national pride there that's absolutely beautiful to see. And the reason is very simple. Each immigrant who comes into Israel, each one of the Jews who were coming home, came because they were delighted to come home. But they also came, they wanted to get something, but they also came perfectly willing to make their contribution. You see, that right mental attitude has a great deal to do with that. And everybody's attitude is important. I don't care whether you're a school teacher or the principal of the school or a salesman or a housewife or a builder or a major in the army. It makes no difference what you are. With the right mental attitude, you can do so much more. Now, here's something I've noticed about attitude. I've noticed everybody's got a good attitude when things are going good. You know, when people are pleasant with them, they have a good attitude. When people smile at them, they smile back. If things are great, they got a good attitude. But when things are not so good, sometimes that's a different story. One of the objectives of the Richer Life course is to, this, is to do this. It's to share with you some procedures and techniques so that when things are good, you're going to have a good attitude. But when things are bad you are still going to have a good attitude, which means that soon things will be good for you. You know, I think the story of Mr. B really says what I want to say about this. Mr. B called a meeting, had all of his people together. He said, I noticed some of you are coming to work late. I noticed some of you are leaving early. I noticed some of you spend too much time on a coffee break. Some of you spend too much time on a lunch break. Now, maybe that's not your fault. Maybe that's my fault. Maybe I have, have not set for you the kind of an example that I should have been setting. But he said, all of that's going to be changed. I'm going to come to work early. I'm going to stay late. Short coffee break, short lunch break. We're going to build a company that's going to be an absolutely beautiful company. Oh, it was, oh, it was a magnificent speech. And his intentions were good. Uh, but about four or five days later, he was out of the local country club, became engrossed in a business conversation, forgot about the time. All of a sudden, he looked at his watch. He said, oh, my goodness, I'm due back at the office right now. He hopped up, made a mad dash to his automobile, hopped in, scratched off, burned rubber, doing about 90 miles an hour down the freeway. And all of a sudden, the long arm of the law entered the picture and gave him a ticket. <laughs> Oh, now you're talking about a man being unhappy, but he was really upset. He says, you know, this is ridiculous. Here I am, a peaceful, tax-paying, law-abiding citizen, minding my own business, and what does this guy do? He comes along and gives me a ticket. What he ought to be doing is out looking for the robbers, the murderers, the arsonists, the people who are breaking the law. Leave us peaceful taxpayers alone. Oh, he was really upset, and by the time he got back to the office, it was about an hour late. So when he walked in, he did what management has done since the beginning of time. Every time they get their hand caught in a cookie jar, they say, look yonder, and then nobody looks here. So in a very loud voice, he called for his sales manager. He said, come on in. I want to find out about the Armstrong accounts. You've been fitting with that thing six weeks or longer. You've had enough time to sell the deal a dozen times. Just come on in here and tell me either, yes, you did sell it or no, you did not sell it. Well, the sales manager very quietly and meekly ducked his head and walked into the room and closed the door behind him and said, Mr. B said, you know, I sure hate to tell you this. I, I, I thought we had that deal. I, I thought it was sold, but at the last minute, something happened. I don't know what it was, but at the last minute, we lost the deal. And I sure am sorry, Mr. B, but if you think he was sorry then, you should have seen him about two minutes later because you're talking about a man getting a ride act read to him. The sales manager really got it. Mr. B said, now this is really ridiculous. For 18 years, you've been my sales manager. For 18 years, I depended on you to bring in new business. And now we have a chance to get the biggest account of all, and what do you do? You blow it. Well, I want to tell you something, friend. Just because you've been here 18 years does not mean that you've got a lifetime contract. Contract. Now, you go out there and replace that business, or I'm going to replace you. Oh, he was really upset. <clears throat> but if you think he is upset, you should have seen the sales manager. 
Sales manager goes storming out of there, slamming the door behind his back, mudding under his breath. This is ridiculous. Why, for 18 years I've been running this company. As a matter of fact, I'm the only one who knows what's going on around here. Why, if it hadn't been for me, they'd have gone broke 15 years ago. And now, just because I louse up and miss one sale, he uses a cheap trick, he threatens to fire me. This is ridiculous. Oh, he was really upset. He called his secretary in. He said, those five letters I gave you this morning, have you gotten them out? Are you going to give me some lousy excuse about fitting with something else? She said, no, don't you remember? You told me that the Hilliard account took precedence over everything else. That's what I've been working on. He said, don't give me any lousy excuses. I told you I wanted those letters out, and I want them out today. And if you can't get them out, just let me know. I'll get somebody that can. Just because you've been here for eight years does not mean that you've got a lifetime contract. A lifetime contract. Lifetime contract. Oh, I spent $1,000 on my eyes. Now my mouth don't want to work. <laughs> Just because you've been here eight years does not mean that you've got a lifetime contract. Now, you're going to get those letters out or I'm going to get you out. I'll tell you, he was really upset. <laughs> but if you think he is upset, you should have seen the secretary. She goes storming out of there, mudding under her breath. This is really ridiculous. For eight years, I've been running this company. As a matter of fact, I'm the only one who knows what's going on around here. Why, if it hadn't been for me, this company would have gone broke 10 years ago or five years ago, right after I got here. Why, I'm doing everything around here. Now, just because I can't do two things at one time, he used a cheap trick, he threatens to fire me, and him fire me as much as I know about him? Who does he think he's kidding anyhow? Oh, she was really upset. She walked out of the switchboard operator's desk. She said, look, I got five letters. I want you to get them out. Now, I know that ordinarily this is not your job, but you don't do anything anyhow, but sit out here and occasionally answer the telephone. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you just one time. I want you to get these letters out. I want them out today, and if you can't get them out, let me know, because I'm going to get somebody that can. Oh, she was really upset. But if you think she is upset, you should have. <laughs> Seen that switchboard operator. She so about to hit the ceiling. This is ridiculous. Why they don't do anything in the back but gossip, drink coffee, talk on the telephone, occasionally get a little bit of work out, and then the very minute they get behind, they come out here and they put it on my desk and say, Now you're gonna get it out, or I'm gonna fire you, and I'm the only one who knows what's going on around here. This is ridiculous. But she got the letters out. Got home, she was still furious. She walked in the front door and slammed the door behind her. Walked in the den. First thing she saw was a twelve year old son laying there on the floor watching television. Second thing she saw was a big rip right across the seat of his britches. She said, son, how many times have I told you? When you come off from school, put your play clothes on. Mother has a hard enough time as it is supporting you and sending you through school. Now you've disobeyed me, and just for that, you're going to go upstairs right now. There's going to be no supper for you tonight and no television for the next three weeks. Oh, she was really upset. But if you think she is upset, you should have... <laughs> you should have seen that little boy. He about here the ceiling. This is really ridiculous. He said, here I am doing something for my own mother when it happened. It was an accident. It could happen to anybody. And mother doesn't even give me a chance to explain it. This is not fair. And about that time, his tomcat <laughs> walked in front of him, which was a mistake. <laughs> Boy gives the tomcat a big old boot and said, you get out of there. <laughs> You've probably been up to some no good yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think about it for a moment. That tomcat was the only creature who could not have altered the series of events, was it? And if you think about it for another moment, wouldn't it have been so much better if Mr. B had just gone directly from the country club to the switchboard operator's house and just kicked that cat himself? <laughs> See, it left all those other people out. Now let me ask you a question. Whose cat have you been kicking? <laughs> now let me ask you another question. Have you been letting somebody kick your cat? You see, ladies and gentlemen, the bump on the Bowery and the superintendent of your schools have got a lot in common. The bum on the Bowery and the president of the bank have got a lot in common. The bum on the Bowery and the mother of the year have got a lot in common. The bum on the Bowery and your pastor have even got a lot in common. The bum on the Bowery and the most successful man or woman you've ever met have got a great deal in common. Every last one of them have suffered frustrations, disappointments, defeats, and setbacks. Every human being that ever trod on planet Earth. Every one of us have had those things happen to us. But the difference between the bum on the Bowery and the superintendent of schools, the difference between the bum on the Bowery and the most successful man or woman you know is the way they react to the negatives of life.
It's the way they react to the cat kickers of life. You see, life is full of cat kickers. And the way we react to them is going to determine how high we're going to go. The way we react to defeat. The way we react when we have failed at one specific time or one specific project. That really is going to be the determining factor. How do you react when somebody kicks your cat? Did you ever check out of a motel and the clerk just literally tears your head off? Can you understand that it's got nothing to do with you? That somebody had just stopped by and kicked his cat before you got there? Did you ever go in a restaurant, you know, for a cup of coffee and you sit there? And you sit there? And you sit there. And finally you say, ma'am, could I, could, could I have a cup of coffee? And she said, can't you say I'm busy? I'll get you as quick as I can. Do you say, we don't have to bite my head off about it, do you? I mean, do you let her pull you down to her level? Or can you understand somebody's been by there kicking her kit before you ever got there? You ever get in a traffic situation? Traffic three blocks in front, traffic three blocks behind, and some idiot behind you sits on his horn, you know? Do you, do you turn around and say, can't you see we got traffic up here? I mean, do you let them pull you down to their level? Or can you understand somebody's just been kicking their cat before you got there? You ever come home from a beautiful day? I mean, everything has gone absolutely great. You walk in the front door whistling and singing, you know, and you say, hi, hon, how you doing? And your maid responds, what do you mean, how am I doing? You're supposed to be in here an hour and a half ago. If you've been putting up with what I've been putting up with all day long, you wouldn't be feeling so good either. I mean, can you understand? Shucks, your mate's not necessarily mad at you. Maybe somebody's been kicking your mate's cat all day long. See, we live in a negative cat-kicking world, so the question comes up, how do, how do you respond when somebody kicks your cat? I mean, are you going to let them pull you down, or are you going to respond properly? Well, let me tell you how to respond. The next time somebody starts to really chew you out, and you're innocent. Now, be careful. You know you're innocent. Uh, first of all, let them finish the chewing. Again, the reason I love the Bible so much is it's got so much practical advice in it. You know, Solomon says in Proverbs, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it is a fool. That's good advice. Let them talk. Let them get it out of their system. The psychologist will tell you that that's fine. Let them get it out. Then the anger is gone, you see. So let them do their uh, cat kicking. Let them do their chewing. But while they're talking, I want you to be quietly, very quietly patting your foot. You know, and while you're patting your foot so that your chewer can't see what you're doing, be muttering under your breath, cat, 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 cat. cat. And while you're saying that, you see, there's no way that you're going to let them get you upset when you're saying cat, 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 cat. Now, let me suggest, let me suggest that you try this at home, first of all, with your mate. And when your mate finishes the chewing, then I want you to smile very politely, very pleasantly, very lovingly. Attitude's important now. The way you say what you're going to say, and then you kind of smile and say, Honey, I just wonder, has, has anybody been kicking your cat today? <laughs> <laughs> and if you survive that one... <laughs> And I got an idea that you will. Why not use that method when you're dealing with somebody else who's trying to kick your cat? Now, the question often comes up when you talk about attitude. Ziegler, are you always up and excited and enthusiastic and all of those good things? Are you always motivated? Now, somebody asked that redhead of mine that the other day, and she said, uh-huh. But the truth of the matter is there are occasions, yes, when even I will get down. Now, let me give you an example. Now, as I give you this example, I want to use it because it's positive and it'll tell you how to get up. That's really what you want to know, not how to get down. Most of us already know that, but how do you get up when you get down? So in this example, let me start by saying that I am not a member of an organized political party. I'm a Republican. <laughs> When President Ford and Mr. Carter competed, I wanted Mr. Ford to win, but the truth of the matter is, more people wanted Mr. Carter to win. So when I went to bed in Detroit, Michigan that night, there in the Pontchartrain Hotel, at two o'clock when New York came into the Carter column, I went to bed just all down in the dumps. Oh, Mr. Carter's gonna be president. Oh, Mr. Carter's gonna be president. And I, and I went to sleep and moaned and groaned and twisted and turned. And the next morning, or during the night, my natural enthusiasm and optimism returned. I knew when I awakened that it had all been a bad dream, that all I had to do was switch on that television set 
And sure enough, Mr. Ford was going to be president, but I switched the television set on and nothing had changed. So now I've got to make a decision. Do I support Mr. Carter, as my Bible says that I should, or am I going to go around the country bad-mouthing the man and trying to pull him down instead of trying to encourage and help our country? Well, obviously, that is the route to take, to help and to build. But I want you to know that I'd worked hard for Mr. Ford. I felt like I had earned a certain amount of misery. And I was, I was absolutely determined that I was going to have me a little of it, and nobody was going to talk me out of it. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to be negative about Mr. Carter until November the 15th. Now, on November the 15th, then I'll be positive. So, until the 15th, I still said some negative things about our new president. But on November the 15th, when I woke up bright and early that morning, I said, oh boy, this is the get positive about Mr. Carter day. And so I started reading the positive qualities of the man. I started reading about his plans for his cabinet. I started reading about his life history. I started talking to friends and supporters and boosters of him. I started listening to what he was saying when he said he was going to trim the bureaucracy. I started looking and listening at a whole lot of things, and I've been absolutely amazed at how much Mr. Carter has changed since November <laughs> the 15th. Now, let me say something. I was negative for several days because we only elect a president about ever uh, four years in it, okay? So I felt I was entitled to that much negativism. But what about everyday events? Let me tell you what you do when you have everyday events. When somebody says, how you doing, and you really are doing bad, I mean, things are just awful. What I want you to do is look at your watch. When they say, how you doing, I want you to look at your watch and say, well, at exactly 3.30, I'll be doing super good. And they might say, well, what's going to happen at 3.30? Then you say, at 3.30, I'm going to be positive. Now, I'm going to be negative until then, but man, at 3.30, I'm going to get positive. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do I understand this right? You're going to be negative until 3.30, and then from 3.30 on, you're going to be positive. I sure am, man, a lot. I can't wait for 3.30 to get here because then I'm going to be positive. They say, now, are you kidding me? You mean you're going to wait till 3.30 to be positive? Why don't you go ahead and be positive now? Then you look at him and you kind of smile and say, you smooth talker, you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you're such a smooth talker, you would do good in my business. And then <laughs> what I'm saying is, you're, you're probably thinking, there, Zayla, that's about the silliest thing that I've ever heard of in my life. And you know, I agree with that. But I'll tell you what it does. It works. You know what you're doing? You're kidding yourself. You're laughing at you. And see, when you can laugh at you, it doesn't bother you if somebody else is laughing at you. This right mental attitude is so tremendously important, and since it is so important, what is the method that you use for getting up when you get down? Now, in the next session, we're going to be giving you a precise formula for that, but in the meantime, let's look at the first four things that we need to do. First of all, you got to face it. You're down. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that's just where you are. You look at it and say, hey, there I am. And then you can, uh, you can look and say, do I like what I see? Am I really happy being despondent, down in the dumps, miserable, and making everybody else miserable? Is this what I really want? But there I am. Face it. That's the first thing to do. You are down. And the second thing you need to do is understand the fact that there are no hopeless situations. There are only some people who lose hope in the face of some situations. You see, the darkest night since the beginning of time did not turn out all the stars. Then there's the third thing that you got to understand about this attitude of yours. You got to know that it is temporary. You see, this too will pass. And because it will pass, then know that your situation is temporary, that it's not always going to be that bad, and I don't care how bad it is. And when you know that it's temporary, when you accept that as the starting point, then you can begin to build it to exactly where you want it to be. And then there's the most important thing which I touched on just a moment ago, and that simply is to make a decision, decide how long you are going to be negative. Decide how long you're going to stay down. I decided to stay down several days because I'd lost a presidential election. I took that thing awful personal, you know. And then after I recognized what had happened after those several days, since then things have gotten better and better and better. Just decide how long 
you're going to stay down. If you feel like you deserve a little misery, that's perfectly all right. You don't drown by falling in water. You only drown if you stay there. And so what you got to decide to do is decide how long you're going to stay around swimming there. And then once you've decided that you're going to do something about it, then the minute you make the decision that you're going to come up, that's the very moment you made the decision about how long you're going to stay down. Oh, you know, I get excited when I watch people grow by the week. I've had the privilege in so many of the Richer Life courses seeing lives change so dramatically in just a question of days. As I think about what this session is, which is number eight, which really opens up so many avenues to so many people who have never been exposed to what positive thinking really is, who've never been exposed to the right mental attitude. And watching you grow and knowing what's going to happen to you as you work with your instructors, you work in your own company and your own family, around your own friends and your own relatives, knowing you see that your attitude is going to play such an important part in their happiness. In one of our classes, we had a young lady who went through the class, had tremendous growth as a result of it. A couple of weeks later, she wrote us back and said, you'll be amazed at how much my daughter has changed as a result of me taking the class. Well, the daughter had never taken the class, but she was getting the benefits because, you see, our attitude does affect those who are around us. Now let's look in this next session at a formula. It's a formula to build an attitude foundation that's so solid, as I indicated earlier, that when things are good, your attitude's going to be good, but when things are bad, your attitude's still going to be good, which means that soon things are going to be good. And with that right mental attitude, I say it again, you can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can be like you want to be, which means that I truly will see you at the top. To watch another amazing Zig Ziglar video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. If you keep on doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep on getting what you've been getting. You gotta change performance. Now, before you can change performance, you gotta change your thinking.